first speaker this morning is Kyle Kastner. He'll be introducing Machine Learning 101. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kyle Kastner. Um, are we seeing slides? So, oh, excellent. Okay. My name is Kyle Kastner. Uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about the basics of machine learning. This is my first PyCon talk, but I've given similar talks in the past. Um, it's great to see how many people are here this morning and how many people are interested in machine learning. So hopefully you'll get a lot out of this talk, and I'll also be taking questions afterwards in 516. Uh, I'm actually in Montreal right now from a place called the Montreal Institute for Learning Algorithms or of Learning Algorithms or Day Learning Algorithms, depending who you talk to. Uh, you're free to follow along on GitHub. So let's start off. What is machine learning? Uh, broadly, I break it into two topics, automation and data analysis. And the resolution is a little too big, but we'll make do. Um, basically, the two kind of approaches you see in machine learning are people who want to automate. They want to do complicated things that normally take humans very, very quickly. And on the other side, you have people like scientists and engineers and oceanographers and all kinds of different backgrounds, business people who want to inspect their processes and figure out what is making them tick, how to be more efficient, and how to be more productive. So I always like to start off with some applications. Basically, the applications of machine learning have exploded in the last five years. Uh, hardware has finally caught up with some of the ideas from the 80s. And the future is very bright. Uh, speech processing is huge. Uh, most of you in the audience have things in your pocket. Uh, Cortana, Siri, Google Voice, all these things are direct applications of recent developments in machine learning to make our lives better. Uh, image processing is another huge one. Uh, Google's been working on self-driving cars. Audi's been working on self-driving cars. A lot of other companies are pushing towards uh, robotics type applications that interact with us in our daily lives. Natural. Language processing is another huge one. Uh, English to French, uh, that's very big for me. I don't speak much French even though I'm in Montreal. It has saved my life and it's only getting better every day. Uh, advertising, uh, there's a talk later in this same session about click-through rates. Uh, this is huge if you wanna monetize your business. Uh, recommendations, Amazon, Yelp, Netflix. Uh, they know what you've bought in the past, they know how you feel about it, and they wanna suggest things that you as a consumer would like. Uh, the images over here on the right are actually recent uh, applications of machine learning from our lab. Uh, the caption below the image is generated by a neural network. It looks at the image, sees what's in it, and then describes the content. Uh, so in this case, you can see it's paying attention to the dog, and it says a dog is standing on a hardwood floor. This is machine learning, just from an image. Down in the bottom right is another example of speech to text. Um, basically an input waveform and the words, Michael, Michael colored the bedroom wall with crayons. Um, not an easy one to say, but one that could be important if you're a parent. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the automation spectrum. Uh, so on the far left, we have handcrafted rules. Uh, if you've worked in any kind of large code base, you've seen this. If, elif, 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 else. Very, very common with lots of magic constants and old timer lore. Uh, we call these expert rules. Uh, they're very useful if they work, very not useful when they break. Uh, and it's not pleasant to deal with this. Uh, we call it don't touch code, lots of magic constants. Um, machine learning in general is trying to abstract away the magic constants so that we know where they came from. We have a driving uh, kind of perspective that tells us, oh, this number comes from our data. So it makes a little more sense than 0.7. Uh, statistics, uh, there's a huge variety of models in the classic statistics literature. I won't talk in detail about algorithms. I'll kind of black box them. It's one of the beauties about machine learning, especially in Python. We have fantastic libraries like scikit-learn that basically let you treat algorithms as a black box. Um, on, on the next column, we have machine learning proper, I guess you could say. Um, it's really kind of a subset of statistics, but everyone argues about what is a subset of what and who is a subset of who. Um, just trying to give some keywords for people to Google later. Um, you're not expected to know what all of this stuff is. And on the far right is the stuff that I currently research and I'm fascinated with, uh, neural networks. I won't really cover that much except for the end. 
but uh, I'll be glad to talk about it after. It's a very interesting new front in machine learning. Okay, so let's do a simple test. Imagine that the red blob is something that came from your data set with a label yes, and the blue dot is something that came from your data set with the label no. Life is good, you're happy. You get a third data point. <laughs> it's the purple star. What do you do? Do you draw a boundary in the middle and say it was a no? Do you draw, do you say it was a yes? Do you look at distances? Do you call it a new point entirely? It's, it's kind of difficult to tell. There's the, it's kind of on its own. It doesn't have any context. What about now? Suddenly, with a little more context about the red data, we can see pretty clearly that the purple point should be associated with the red class, most likely. Like it's pretty unlikely that the blue class magically stretches over and grabs the purple point. This ties into something called the manifold hypothesis. Don't worry too much about what a manifold is, but if you Google like manifold hypothesis, you can find some uh, literature on the subject. Basically, it says that if you think about all the possible images you could ever see, say like 100 by 100 pixels, that's a huge, huge, huge amount of possible information. But most of the stuff we see is structured and logical and makes sense. Like my shirt, my shirt is green. If you saw a pixel of green in the video, you would say, oh, that probably has a green pixel next to it and a green pixel next to it and a green pixel next to it. And at some point, there would be a boundary where the color scheme changes. Most of the information we perceive is kind of like this. Even stuff, that pretty much anything that humans can analyze visually or think about and reason about tends to look more like the pictures of the cats and dogs than it does the random static, which is all possible images. So out of all possible images, there's a really small subset that we care about in machine learning. And so our goal is kind of to find this manifold and do stuff. Very technical, I know. <laughs> so the baby kitty, you could imagine, is kind of on the baby kitty side of the manifold, and adult kitties are in the middle, and dogs are somewhere far away. I use cats and dogs as an example a lot because uh, it's simple to think about, and they're cute to boot. <laughs> OK, so if we wanted to do one of the basic things in machine learning, is say, this is this, or this is this. This is a cat. This is a dog. This is spam. This is not spam. Uh, most classification can be thought of in simple terms as drawing a boundary in some space. You say, OK, at some point I have to draw a threshold and say, you are this and you are this. Um, there's other things that try to draw soft boundaries with probabilities. We'll talk a little more in a minute. But basically, that's what classification boils down to. The information might be really complicated and crazy where you couldn't plot it in 2D, but that's basically what you're trying to do. If we go a step farther to a task that I think is a little harder, uh, regression. Uh, instead of having just one or two or a small set of labels, you're trying to basically look at the statistics of something that's happening and predict what it will do, predicting the future. I mean, obviously, like this is the dream of every stock trader ever. Oh, man, look, 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 it's going up, it's going up. Today I bet, today I bet, I'm going to make a huge amount of money. Oh, no, the stock crashed. Uh, if you can do regression well, there are a lot of interesting applications. Um, you can also think of it in two dimensions. If you saw a picture of the Mona Lisa with the top half of the picture cut off, what would you do? You would imagine the top half of the Mona Lisa because it's a very familiar image. If you see a picture of someone without a head, you imagine the head in place. This is a form of regression, a, f a form of imagination. And I'll talk about this a little more in the examples. So those are the two basic things you can do in machine learning. There's a lot more, and I'm trying not to get into it, but you can broadly categorize the kind of tasks you want to do into classification or regression. Uh, so the core of machine learning, uh, at least in my opinion, is about learning functions. So imagine you had a code base uh, written by a really, really fantastic expert coder, and he had magic functions for recommending movies, translating French to English, uh, telling you what is in this image, and you were driven to debug it. What would you do? You, you would have no idea what's going on in those three tiny dots. It could be thousands and thousands of lines or five if statements with constants. Nobody knows. So our goal in machine learning is to learn the middle part. We have an input, and we want to get some output. It could be a label. It could be uh, floating point numbers. It could be the text that corresponds to an image, like what is in this image. 
a dog sitting on a hardwood floor. Mathematically, this is only math, I promise, this is it. The only math is you can say y equals f of x. f is the function, x is the input, y is the output. That simple. Uh, to extend it a little more, we typically say y equals f of x given theta. You can imagine theta as like magic sliders that you can move up and down, and when set just right, these functions work. So typically in machine learning, our goal is to learn theta. If we're lucky and we have probabilistic things, then we can say the probability of x given the setting of the sliders is equivalent to the probability of the sliders given the data and the probability of the data. This sounds like a mouthful, but what it really means is that if we have data x from our database, we can learn theta. And if we learn theta correctly, we can apply it to new data, and we can get new y's out for things we've never seen before, if it's done right. And the magic is in doing it right. And that's hopefully what I'll introduce you to doing and probably talk about a lot the rest of the conference. So one of the big things about running a machine learning algorithm, train validation and test splits. It is very easy to cheat in machine learning and think that you have done magic that no one has done. Unfortunately, uh, I've done this a lot myself. Everyone who deals with machine learning has done it either on accident or unknowingly, and uh, it's very important to talk about. So the basis is, on the left, we have red. That's the data that we know exists. That's our database, that's our CSV file, that's our Excel spreadsheet, whatever. On the right is blue data, future data. We, don't, we have no idea where it's coming from. It could be another database. Um, Mary from accounting could bring down another Excel spreadsheet. I mean, nobody knows. But you want to be ready for the blue data. So how do you simulate the blue data if all you have is the red? Well, you split off a chunk of the red data and say, this is my fake test data. This is, this is my fake information that I'm going to test myself against. And I'm going to stay true to that test. And if I do well on both parts, I'm going to imagine that the blue part will do well also. So we really want our systems to work on new data. This is a very important point. Validation sets that I'll show in all the examples are key to making sure we can work on new data and that we haven't cheated in some way. Um, validation data simulates new test data. So if you've ever done Kaggle, blue is kind of like the stuff that you submit for answers on Kaggle. And then when you see the leaderboard, you say, oh, my algorithm is way worse than it worked on my computer. What's happening? And that's machine learning. <laughs> Okay, so a brief mention about packages to use. Uh, I recommend one of two packages, or both if you're feeling you know, extra adventurous. Uh, Anaconda from Continuum, Canopy from Nthought. Both fantastic, easy to install packages. They have NumPy, SciPy, Scikit-Learn, Pandas, all this stuff installed for you already. It takes a lot of the headache out of doing data science on your laptop. Um, if you've ever gone through the pain of compiling NumPy from scratch and getting it in the right place, it's not fun. And Anaconda will totally take care of that, as will Nthought. So keep these packages in mind when you're messing around with the code. OK, so now we'll go on to some examples. And I'll take a moment to transition here, if I can find my cursor. OK. And it's not going. Gotta love demos. So yeah, if you guys know any uh, jokes or something, just tell them in your head right now. <laughs> there we go, there we go. Okay, so kind of small, decent size. Let me up the resolution just a little bit. Okay, so I have 15 minutes. Four examples, I'm gonna blow through them as fast as I can. Check out the code, ask me questions later. I try to do the best I can, but like everyone else, I have bugs. So if you find them, put them on GitHub and we'll try to get them fixed. Okay, so first off, we'll talk about recommender systems. Uh, a lot of, lot of, lot of people are interested in recommender systems, and they're used in a lot of applications you wouldn't expect, uh, besides just like recommending movies or products like one of the nice ones I saw was recommending different recipes based on what you've cooked before that's cool that's empowering you could build one for yourself like a custom recommender system that tells you what recipes you might like uh, so anyways 
the goal of a recommender system is people over a whole data set of products will rate some stuff and they won't rate other stuff. And for example, if I had a twin brother, we might almost rate the same things, but a little bit different. The goal of a recommender system is to figure out based on what the twin likes, you might like. Or if he was my evil doppelganger twin, <laughs> he would like the opposite things. And the recommender system would say, okay, anything that guy likes, he's not gonna like, so don't, don't recommend it to him. So the first thing I'm gonna do is go through a data set of jokes. I won't actually print out any of the jokes, uh, but you can actually incorporate side information like what's in the joke to do this. Uh, but even just the rating, who rated it, and what the joke was, like an index, is good enough. Uh, first, we load the data set. Um, don't want to download it twice. Uh, unzip the data set. Doesn't really unzip it, just lets us access it. This is a nice thing that Python does. Um, we can use pandas to actually read an Excel spreadsheet directly. Um, so a lot of you who are dealing with messy data, you're going to get Excel spreadsheets. Um, read Excel from pandas is a lifesaver. Huge, huge, huge help. Uh, because not everyone will be able to send you a CSV file. <laughs> So, uh, as mentioned, we want to use 80% of the data for training, last 20% for validation. I'm using SciPy sparse matrices. Uh, don't worry about this too much. Uh, there's a lot of good reading material on the SciPy tutorials about it. The big picture is that V right here, that's our whole database of videos or movies or recipes and the users that rated them. This might be a one, a five, a two, a seven, four, nine, blank, blank, blank. We don't know. But we believe that people are not completely unique. We believe there's a manifold of, of low rank structure that we can learn about users and about the movies. So if we can break this V into W and H, we can do some interesting stuff. So first off, let's see what a, v, a toy V would look like. This. Kind of crazy, kind of weird. You wouldn't look at it and say, oh wow, I can totally, you can see there's some structure, but you can't really tell what the structure is. Turns out, it's a pretty simple structure. We have a small matrix like this, that is the H, and a matrix like this, that is the W. When you combine these together with a dot product, you end up getting some really interesting pattern like this. So our goal is to go from this to things like this that we can reason about more easily. So I implemented an algorithm called probabilistic matrix factorization. Don't worry too much about it. Nice thing about machine learning is you can black box things until you decide you want to get deep in the math. Um, until then, you can just kind of call PMF and get the outputs and do stuff with it. It's really great. And scikit-learn doesn't have this algorithm, but it has the rest that I'm going to introduce. So we go through PMF, da 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 da. We get a validation mean absolute error of 3.78. What the heck does that mean? Basically, these jokes were rated from minus 10 to 10. So our typical error is somewhere between I love the joke and I liked the joke, or I'm completely indifferent to like, eh, or eh, it, was, it was OK, it was kind of funny, or whatever. Um, so this means we have some idea over something that's really complicated, like a joke, of how you might feel about it um, given a set of jokes you'd liked before without any, looking at any of the joke content. Uh, very powerful, very cool stuff. So this is kind of a plot of what the ground truth looks like, and this is what our recommender system reconstructs. So you can tell it's kind of like blurring things out, but it has a decent idea of what the matrix is and how the structure is. Um, so if we actually look at the factors, they're not as cool as the, the basis factors we found before, but these, kind of, we call them low rank because they're skinny, either horizontally or vertically. Um, these matrices tell you something. They tell you that users are not completely unique. There's like groups and categories of users. And so each column of the matrix on the left is actually like a subset of users. And if you have enough inspection, you can actually like group users together and do things with that and figure out marketing and all kinds of uh, business related stuff. But that's not what I do. I'm a researcher, so I just do this and move on. Okay, so 
Spam classification, I'm gonna go a little faster here. Um, this is based on a tutorial by Radim Rahirek. I probably pronounced his name wrong, but he's awesome. Uh, author of Gensim, does great blog posts, great everything. Uh, check out his example for a lot more detail. Basically, we're gonna pull up some really raunchy spam text messages and figure out if they're spam or not. Um, I'm not gonna highlight them too much because they're pretty nasty. Like, people who get this in their phone, like, I don't know, maybe get a new phone or something. <laughs> so we'll download the data set like we did before. Don't wanna download it twice. Um, we'll do some cleanup, uh, string processing in Python. Um, then we wanna figure out, okay, if we just pick Spam or ham, what would we get? So if our classifier is really dumb and said everything is good, let it through the spam filter, we'd get 86%. Um, so if we do better than that, we're doing something. We're doing some filtering. So once again, we do training and test data because this is huge. Uh, then we create a text cleaner in scikit-learn. Basically, the API of scikit-learn could be summed up in three words. <laughs> fit. Well, two words, fit, predict, that's it. Create the class, or create the instance of the class, fit it, and then predict, that's it. If you create a pipeline, it has the same thing. Take the pipeline of things, fit them, predict with them. Really great, really nice. <laughs> so here we use something called a TFIDF vectorizer. Don't worry about it, it takes text and makes it into numbers. Uh, then we have something called Bernoulli Naive Bayes, Treat it as a black box that draws a classification line. That's it. We train it. We predict the training set and the test set. We get 98% on the training set and 97% on the test set slash validation set. So what that means is we're doing a pretty good job of generalizing to stuff we've never seen before. Um, yeah, this is kind of what there is. I'm not going to go through what it says, but it's pretty raunchy stuff. So you can see why this might be useful if your phone's getting blown up by spammers. So example three, digits. I'm not gonna say much here, except that it shows the manifold structure we talk about. So we have 64, we have digits data set. Each one is eight by eight. We plot them with something called TSNI and something like PCA. You can think of both of these as kind of learning a W and H, but only really caring about the H, typically. Um, this one does it in, with one algorithm, this one does it with another. But what really matters is that we actually see the structure I talked about earlier. These ones over here kind of look like twos. You have this part right here, you have the bottom part. These one, this one is very far from twos, it's just a line. Um, you come over here to fives, Okay, life is good. There's a three over here. Okay, a squiggly three. Uh, and then over here, you have the opposite. You have a five that looks like a three and a three that looks like a five. And zeros don't really get mistaken for anything else. Um, this is what we talk about when we talk about a manifold structure. You could imagine trying to find zeros, drawing a line like this. Everything else, zeros. If you're lucky, this works in 2D. If you're unlucky, you can't really visualize it. It's the name of the game. Okay, so the last slide that I'm gonna go through pretty fast, uh, deep neural networks. Uh, I've been working on a package with my friend, uh, Michael Eichenberg, and the goal is to wrap deep neural networks as a black box using the same API as scikit-learn. So if your whole goal is like, I don't know how to train deep neural networks, I don't have GPUs, I just wanna use them on my MacBook Air. All of these examples will run on my MacBook Air. This one took about five minutes. Um, you should be able to use them easily and apply them to new data, and we're really trying to make it a tool for everyone. Um, check it out, let us know what you think, um, but hopefully this will be a motivating example of why you want to use the package. So we wanna find sloths. We're really into sloths. We're sloth photographers or sloth hunters or whatever, but only three-toed sloths, not two-toed sloths. Three toes, very specific. How would we do it? Okay, so let's ignore the whole neural network thing for a minute. There's a talk this afternoon about neural networks. I encourage you to go check it out. Uh, but let's just pretend we had something that could look at a chunk of data like this and tell you what's in it. Just, okay, that's trees, next. Okay, that's trees, next. That's some weird fur, next. 
now imagine you run that over an entire image. And then you say, was there a sloth in that box or not? You get back something like the bottom right. All of these points correspond to a sloth match. You could draw a box around that. Congratulations, you're finding sloths in arbitrary images. Um, given that you have this magic thing in the yellow box, and we do, then your life is pretty easy. So what's one other thing we can do? Um, there's a hierarchy to objects. So instead of searching for the complicated scientific name for sloth, we just want to type sloth. Or if we want to look for cats, or we want to look for dogs, we want to type cat and dog, not like pit bull, terrier, or like English descendant, whatever. So WordNet gives us the ability to do that. It's a tree structure that tells us exactly how different nouns are related to each other. So what we can actually do is search for cats and dogs the same way and draw boxes around them in arbitrary images. So we do the exact same thing as before. We move the box over every subset of the image. We say, was there anything that fits under the subtree cat or anything that fits under the subtree dog? If it fits cat, we gather up all those points, draw a box around it. If it fits dog, we gather up all the points, draw a box around it. Image processing can be that simple. Um, so this is kind of my motivating example for uh, learning more about neural networks and um, in general, learning more about machine learning. So I am pretty much done. I guess I just want to say one more thing. I have some thank you slides, but it's going to be really hard to go back to them. So I'm not going to worry about it. I just want to say personally, thank you very much for coming this morning. Thank you for being interested in machine learning. And please stick around for the rest of the talks. Thanks, Kyle. Um, the next talk in this room will be experimental pure mathematics using SAGE. That'll start at 11.30.